Welcome into another episode of Cyberly. I'm your host, Blythe Brumley, and on the show, we talk B2B marketing, the attention economy, and how it all fits into the world of logistics. And we got another good show for you today. We are going to be talking about one-person marketing team tools that will help you streamline a lot of your different processes whenever you're trying to you know, do all the hard things when it comes to marketing your business. Then we're going to have two guests on today's show, Michelle LeBlanc. She is the founder and CEO of Drop and Hook, and she's going to be highlighting the good marketing strategies that she sees companies creating. Then we're going to be talking to Nick Klein. He's from OEC Group, and he's going to be talking about the shortage of transformers. So he's going to be joining us a little bit later on in the show. And then finally, we are going to wrap up the show with the logistics of the internet. And it really, like, it kind of sounds like a snooze fest of a story, but I promise it's exciting. I got really excited writing and researching it last night. So we're going to round out the end of the show with that. But first, let's get into our first topic. And that is really tools that help me as a one-person marketing team help me with a lot of my different marketing tasks and marketing tools, and especially things that help me run my business a little bit smoother. And so with a lot of you know marketing campaigns within this industry, they're, they're primarily fueled by people similarly in my position. They're one-person marketing teams. They're likely either one person entrepreneur that or a small team or you know maybe it's something that happened to me first in my career when I got into the freight industry where I was you know the receptionist I was the executive assistant and then I was also tasked with all of the marketing responsibilities for the company so if any of those roles feel like you or feel like you know somebody within your organization then this is going to be a good roundup of tools to use to help streamline a lot of your different marketing processes but with that said these are just tools that I have found useful because frankly, I've spent a lot of money and a lot of time over the last 10 plus years in this space and trying to find tools that are worth their weight and worth their time and money investment because that's where a lot of challenges come into play is that we hear and we see a lot of different marketing tools that are available and they sound really good. They sound like something like magic that's really going to help you streamline your marketing only to find out, you know, later on that it just was a complete waste of time and money. So knowing that it's really important before you add any kind of software or any kind of tool, especially the ones I'm about to talk about is to map out your own processes first and then figure out where technology plays a role. Because you might not need that fancy new software that's going to cost thousands of dollars and probably likely take you, you know, a few months in order to learn how to implement it. So with all of that said, let's get into the first tool that I absolutely love that helps me as a one-person marketing team, and that is ClickUp. ClickUp is one of the most important tools that I use to run my business. It's really the single most important tool that I operate everything out of that platform. And it's essentially a project management tool where I can organize everything from ideas to multi-month projects. And you can do everything from manage contractors, you know, team members, there's file storage, there's note taking, there's automation. Um, basically, you can have your entire team on this project and you can have different automations set up. You can ask some of the production crew from FreightWaves that have all the notifications that they get when I'm in there making a show plan or future setting up future interviews and future topics to talk about on this show. And so knowing all of that, there's a few use cases that I wanted to highlight. And that's making your ideas actionable. Like it's really difficult that as a creative person or as an entrepreneur, you know, you have a lot of ideas. How do you get the ideas out of your head and onto a system in a system that can make those ideas actionable? And that is ClickUp for me. It helps me make my ideas actionable. There are a couple other use cases. I mentioned interview coordination. I reach out to a lot of people in order to schedule guests far in advance so that we can make sure that we have proper time to do research on the topics that we're bringing them on for. So I typically will do these planning sessions a few weeks out from a scheduled show date. So that just that interview coordination just helps me keep a record of people that I've reached out to, that I haven't heard from, that I have heard from. So that's a use case for it. Also, content post-production and the distribution process. You know, we talk a lot on this show about how content marketing, you know, 80% of your content marketing should really be on the distribution side of things, while 20% should be on the creation side of things. Um, so content post-production, so the editing, the getting a blog post up, um, sending it out on an email newsletter, those kinds of things are all done within the ClickUp system. And then also project and business roadmap creation and and tracking. If I have an idea, I don't want to get 
you know, distracted and just, I, I've done this before where I have an idea and I go tell my development team that, hey, let's make this idea a reality. And a few months later, you know, I'm knee deep in this project and I have no idea what the end goal was going to be. So this system helps me identify and take those ideas and just keep a place to store those ideas and not just run with it without actually vetting the idea in the first place. So ClickUp is by far my most crucial tool. I use it probably a half a dozen times every single day. So cannot recommend them enough. The next tool I want to recommend, it's kind of a gimme, but it's so crucial to every part of my business as well. And that's Google Docs. I run my show notes off of Google Docs. I probably write, uh, I don't know, anywhere from say 5,000 to 10,000 words per episode in order to make sure that I'm getting enough research in. Um, So Google Docs is a great place to collaborate. It's also a great place where I list out, you know, a lot of different B-roll that, you know, working with the FreightWaves team that I'm able to link to pretty easily. We're able to collaborate. We're able to add comments to different sections without it, you know, kind of overtaking the document itself. So that's another one. There are other few ways that you can use Google Docs that you might not have even thought of. Say you're not Maybe you're not a really good writer or you just prefer to speak to text and you prefer that function. Google Docs has that feature as well. So you could use their dictation feature and you could just speak into a microphone and Google Docs will spell check. They will type out everything that you say. They have, you know, some some smarter tools that will correct, you know, the grammar and the spelling of the things that you're you're telling the system that you want to have in the or the text that you want on the Google Doc itself. Um, so we mentioned collaboration mode and then also. Also, one of my favorites is making a research document that I can use on the plane and then turning it offline. So you you can make that document available offline because if you've ever tried to use, you know, the in plane, especially on a flight, like you buy the Wi-Fi, this like go-go Wi-Fi and it's crap. It's really like the worst thing. You might as well just like not have any internet whatsoever. And an application like Google Docs is just not going to load. It's not going to function properly. If you try to just run directly off the plane Wi-Fi, it's crap. So what instead you should do is before your flight or while you're in the airport, go to that document, turn it into offline mode and and then everything that you type into that document while you're on the plane or while you're you're doing some additional writing or you know whatever you're doing within Google Docs at least it will save it for you and you can work off that application and then when you land when you get a better signal then it will automatically save and allow that collaboration to take place so now that, that's Google Docs next one up on the list is Active Campaign. Active Campaign is an email marketing tool that really specializes in automations. And email for me has been on the back burner for too long. I noticed over the summer when I was having my sort of like come to Jesus moment when it comes to like analyzing my business, which I do like twice a year, I have a come to Jesus moment where I look at what's working, what's not working. And my distribution for my content, I was focused really heavily on social media. And then I wasn't really focused on email a lot. Um, so active campaign has really helped me with a lot of different automation campaigns. And what I mean by automation campaigns is that when someone signs up for my email newsletter, I want them to get a notification that, Hey, this new podcast has dropped or Hey, a new cyberly episode has been dropped. And I want them to get that email notification immediately. So through my different tools that we have set up through the website that connect to active campaign, we're able to send those out automatically. So that's what I've been prioritizing over the last couple of months is building out those different functionalities, training myself up on the platform so that I can create these campaigns myself, get them rolling, and then also set up some additional automations where, say, for example, you send out, say I send out a notification, hey, we just dropped this new podcast episode. If someone doesn't click on a link to listen to the episode, or maybe they just delete it, or maybe they just open it and never do anything, or maybe they don't ever open it at all, you can set up different automations to resend that campaign because things happen. People get busy. They're not likely to, you know, always be waiting, not not likely at all, to be waiting, you know, with bated breath for your email to come through. And sometimes they people, especially if you're like me, you treat email like a to-do list. And so if you have emails within your to-do list, sometimes you just delete them. But with that setting with an active campaign, I can resend that campaign to anyone who didn't open the email who didn't click on any links and then with hopes that, you know, maybe I'm catching them at a better time the next time I send it. So those are a few, there's way more automations. They also have a CRM capability, which I've transferred my entire CRM platform over to them as well. 
connections with all of the different platforms that I use. It's really great. So Active Campaign, I have been loving. Now, the next one, I've mentioned this one a few times on this show periodically, and that's copy.ai. Uh, as a one-person marketing team, I cannot stress it enough how much this tool helps me. And a lot of flack can sort of be given to you know one of these AI writers, because that's essentially what this is. They're an AI writer. You take a few different bullet points, and you input it into their system, and they spit out a bunch of different other ideas that you know maybe you would want to use, or maybe you don't want to use. If you're watching on the screen right now, you can kind of see a demo of me using this product. And what it helps me with is that maybe I have a new landing page that I'm creating for the site. I have a few bullet points that I really want to hammer home. And so I enter the few bullet points into the system and it will spit out a bunch of different text variations of that same text that I've already inputted into the system. So it's basically like another set of eyes on the content that you're already creating. And if you need even if you're not like a very skilled writer, maybe you just want to have some ideas for, you know, social media posts or an email newsletter or an email sequence that you're going to send out to prospective leads and things like that. Um, this tool can also help you with that as well. I know a lot of freight brokers out there are working as essentially, you know, one person shows and their marketing team helps them, you know, a little bit, but they're more focused on other areas and they might not necessarily have time to create an email marketing campaign, you know, for every salesperson within the organization. So if you find yourself, you know, having ideas like that, where you want to come up with your own email campaign, if you want to start posting to social media, um, if you want to do all of the things when it comes to marketing, and you don't have access to other writers or other editors, copy.ai is a really low cost, affordable solution. I think it's like 400 bucks for the entire year. And you can use it just over and over and over again. Highly, highly recommend um, that tool. They none of the uh, site, I should note that none of these tools are paying me to say this. I'm an active user of each one of these tools. So I speak from experience. Now, um, with copy.ai. So we talked about that one. Next up on the list is Canva. Now Canva, you might have heard the big news with Adobe buying Figma last week, which is a big deal in the creative world. But I would argue that Canva's news last year should be even bigger because they're known as a graphic design tool. And that's where I use it for, um, I can say brand templates. I can have different logos and colors for different brands and I can have them automatically, you know, saved and created and stored within Canva system that makes editing photos really, really simple. They also have a ton of templates that help you, kind of like copy.ai, they help you give that extra, you know, sort of oomph when it comes to your creativeness. You might come to Canva with an idea and you want to see it expounded on. And so using that platform, you can really go through all of their different templates to find the different um, the styles that you like that fit within your brand. And then you can use use those tools and you can save those different graphics that you're creating as a template so that you can quickly reuse in the fur in in the future. They also have a really cool resizing tool. Um, that, so if you create an image that is really great for Instagram, then you can automatically resize it into Twitter or Facebook or any of these other different, you know, social media sizes. There's so many, but Canva has it all stored within the platform. That is what the platform existed before the news that dropped last week. So with the news that dropped last week, Canva has now added the ability to have a website builder. So if you are interested in like a Squarespace or a Wix type, you know, beginner style website, then those different those different tools should be shaking in their boots right now because Canva has just created a way for you not only to build a website on their platform quickly, but they do it in a way that you can buy the domain and you can get hosting all within the Canva platform. So if you're already creating your graphics in one area, then you can quickly add them to your site all within the same platform. So um, yes, website builder, great news. They also announced whiteboards. So you can kind of have that collaboration again, like we talked about with Google Docs. Um, speaking of docs, they have a docs functionality too, to help you kind of spruce up and liven up your documents. So it's pretty clear that Canva is kind of coming for that office suite of technology solutions, but in a more creative way. You can kind of tell that, you know, with Microsoft and with Google, a lot of their different platforms are more based around just 
I don't want to say like the developer model, but it really is sort of like developers created this versus Canva, where it's very clear that a designer was the one who came up with this platform first and then has a really strong focus on overall just stuff that looks good. So that's another one. So whiteboard stocks, also print on demand. If you come up with a design that you really like, especially a lot of drivers out here, especially a lot of trucking companies, if you're making a lot of graphics you know, for Truck Driver Appreciation Week, they now have a print on demand functionality where you can come up with your designs and then you can send them off to be printed on a t-shirt, to be printed on a coffee mug or really, you know, anything that's in their print on demand store. Um, so that was another one. And then my personal favorite is the video editor functionality, which they're going to be adding more features to this platform soon. But one of the bigger things that I think is really important is that with the video editor, you can take footage, any of your footage or footage that's already available for free to use within the platform, as long as you have a pro account and you can remove the background from the video and it allows you to take maybe a frame, say you can use, you know, my face, for example. So with this particular video, I could cut out everything in the background and take this video of me talking and, and you know, my face and then put it on another video background. I think it's a lot of fun. I've been playing around with that tool as well. It's really a creative suite for the modern day marketer. And so if you haven't jumped on Canva yet, go ahead, give it a shot. It's they, they have free accounts that you can go and try, but some of these tools you might have to have a pro account to use, but even a pro account is 120 bucks a year. That is a bargain when you think about about all of the additional tools that you'll have access to. And I mean, a video editor in general, uh, if you're buying that kind of software is at least a couple hundred dollars every single year. So if you can kind of bundle some of the things that you're looking for, or some of the tools that you're looking to experiment with, Canva is the one that's going to make it the easiest for you. It's the most affordable. And I guarantee you're going to get the most bang for your buck. So those are a few of my different tools that really help me that I use on damn near on a daily basis, especially when it comes to ClickUp. Um, but hopefully you liked a lot of those different tools. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bring in our first guest, and that is Michelle, CEO and founder of Drop and Hook. So welcome in, Michelle. First question, any of those tools, what are your favorite tools to run your business? Well, you know, it's so funny that you started with ClickUp because when you sent me this question in advance, you said you were going to be talking about this. I, um, you know, my mind immediately went to like, oh, well, we use Sprout Social and HubSpot. And then I was like, you know, what's really been great over the last year that we've added in is ClickUp. Um, you know, I've been uh, growing my team. So we went from two people to five people and just keeping track of all of that communication between folks and collaborating and having multiple different projects going at once. Um, you know, that, that tool has been amazing. And I think we've barely even scratched the surface of everything that you can do in there. So like they've got the 100%. whiteboards and all that different stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. It's one of those tools that like, I keep finding new ways to use it. And I, I know that I'm not taking the, the full advantage of, of all the powerful solutions, but you just mentioned you and your team and how you're growing. So, so give us a little bit of background on how you got involved with marketing and how you eventually launched your company, Drop and Hook. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I got my start in marketing. I'm like going to age myself a little bit um, pre social media really being as much of a thing as it is today. Um, I was actually working in a kind of generalist um, marketing role, doing a lot of like copywriting, email marketing, print pieces. Um, and my boss at the time was like, I keep hearing about Twitter. Do you think we ought to be doing that? <laughs> um, so it was right when Twitter really first became a space that brands were getting into. And, uh, and I happened to just be in the right place at the right time to uh, be assigned to be the person to look into that. And uh, we did, in fact, get into it. And fast forward to many years later, I spent a lot of time working in um, ad agencies. And to be honest, I never really thought about transportation or logistics. Uh, you know, I was the sort of person to sit in an office in New York City and not look at the stuff around me and think about how it got there. Um, and I uh, ended up moving to a different agency where our largest client was a trucking company and started learning about that world and working on some truck driver recruiting and, and getting my feet wet in that space. And um, I just fell in love with it. And what I always say about that moment is it feels like 
suddenly you have a backstage pass to a part of the world that you didn't even realize existed. And you start seeing all of these connections with logistics of how everything comes together and all of the different many careers and lives that are impacted Mm -hmm. by it. And uh, so I became, I guess, a bit of a um, logistics nerd. And uh, from there, when I decided to go out on my own in 2018, I, uh, you know, I just had gathered, um, some, some data about that world, uh, and saw that it was a place where there was uh, a need and a lot of companies, like, as you described, where there was a one person marketing team who maybe needed some assistance. And so that was where I really decided to focus my energies. Um, and, Flew under the radar for a little while and then uh, officially launched the Drop and Hook brand in, in 2021. And we've been growing since then. And Drop and Hook is uh, social media and content marketing specifically for the transportation and logistics industry. So that's really all that we do. Everything is uh, a component of that. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating how you, you, when you talk about the logistics industry, it really is one of those industries that it's almost like the CIA where you only notice it when things go wrong, right? It's one of those like, <laughs> yeah. oh, everything's running smoothly. And oh, just kidding. No, it's not. Um, we're going to everybody yeah. mainstream, you know, starts to complain about it. But speaking of different freight companies and and the ones that not only you work with, or maybe you see out in the world, what freight company or what marketing strategies are freight companies getting right? And then what are they getting wrong? Yeah, I mean, so I think that there are a lot of companies right now that are waking up to the idea of, um, I guess I'm going to say personal branding as a, uh, as a sales channel or as a marketing channel. So in the B2B world, you know, as long as I think such a thing existed, business was built on relationships. Um, but I think for a very long time that lived kind of over here in the sales realm and the marketer sat over here and, you know, the two didn't talk to each other at all. Um, (laughs) at least, you know, frequently, I think that was the case, at least in a company with enough different people sitting within it, um, to have those as two separate teams. And more recently, I feel like, uh, you know, maybe it was a reaction to the pandemic. Um, More people have been adopting things like LinkedIn and realizing that there's an opportunity to go out and connect with your customers digitally, um, you know, not just by having a website, but actually having your individual employees become um, the faces of your company. And, you know, what I say to companies who are afraid of that idea is they already are. Um, these are the people that, you know, are doing business with your customers and the experiences that your customers are having are, are being guided by these people. So the best thing you can really do is think about how do we want to be strategic about that and, um, you know, make sure that our, you know, core values are really strong and our people understand what it is that we stand for and what our products are and have the tools that they need to be successful. And so when the, I, I'm thinking of, as you were talking, I was thinking of this incident that I saw happen on LinkedIn from, you know, several folks within our, our space and how one employee, you know, of a big company kind of made a little, I, I a little like bit of a gap. About, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's one of those situations where it's like, oh, that is a real life example of, you know, a brand allowing their employees to be vocal on LinkedIn. And then one person just makes, you know, maybe the wrong kind of insinuation. He probably didn't mean it. To, for it to land that way, but you're still responsible for how it lands. Are there any kind of like guidance that maybe companies should have when they're telling their employees, yes, we want you to post on social media, um, but we want you to do it in a responsible way? Are there any kind of like guidelines that you're seeing that maybe would be useful for other companies to kind of, you know, maybe protect themselves in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, um, I actually think Sprout Social has a free resource that I really like that's like a social media policy template. Um, That's a really good starting point for anybody that's looking for something like that. And you don't have to be a Sprout Social customer to get it. And, uh, you know, I'll I'll join you in saying they're not paying me to say this. I just happen to like it. Um, So if you don't have one, probably good to think about having that. Um, But I really think it it is just... uh, 
something where marketing teams um, need to be proactive about giving people the uh, the knowledge to be successful and um, the guidance on what to do and look for those people who are interested. You know, like I always talk about them as the hand raisers, so the people that are already out there and saying like, yes, I like to post to social media. I'm excited about this. I have that passion. And um, helping to coach them not on what specifically they need to say, but, you know, here are some guidelines of how we want to talk about ourselves. Um, Maybe here are some topics that we as a company are particularly excited about right now. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, here's where you can kind of find our resources from the marketing department. Are there some kind of toolkits that you can build and, and share out internally and give people what they need or teach them how to use Canva if that's what they're uh, they're excited about and they want to be able to turn around a graphic and still have it follow your brand standards. Yeah, 100%. I, I completely agree. I'm going to have to Google that that Sprout social template because I think that that's something that every company should be, you know, a little... Companies were probably already a little weary of letting their, you know, employees freely post on social media. So that's... I think that's a really great idea for the marketing team to not... To, to help and kind of push the... Steer them in, in one, you yeah. know, sort of company brand <laughs> and, <yeah>. away. <laughs> Yeah. And some companies try to, their reaction is just like, lock it down. Nobody can post about us. But I think that's a, that's a wasted opportunity if you, you know, don't take those people that are excited and and give them something positive to do. 100%. And and so you you had kind of, you know, mentioned this a little bit earlier about the relationship between marketing and sales. And, you know, historically it's a little bit combative, you know, they're kind of against each other, but in recent years, we've kind of seen the more molding together and working together. Do you, I, I've seen that happen in other industries. I'm curious if you've seen that happening in the freight industry and maybe some ways that, you know, marketing and sales can have an improved working relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I think one thing that has been really positive about technology becoming more accessible, like marketing automation technology and things like that, is that um, for sales professionals, it is an opportunity to see something that really helps them in their day-to-day life, right? If, um, if you can create automation technology that is nurturing your leads and, you know, kind of have the data that comes from those platforms usually that can show, oh, your lead did this, did this, did this. Wow, maybe you've gained an insight now from knowing, like, I never realized that people went to these three pages on our website. And uh, maybe that's really interesting because that's telling us a story about what this person is interested in or or, um, is looking for that, you know, maybe there's content that we haven't even thought of putting out there yet, but it's something that can go to them. So I feel like if sales and marketing can kind of collaborate on that data sharing level and, uh, you know, everyone benefits from kind of automating those tasks that are, that are the routine kind of, okay, you know, we have to send out the scheduling link in order to make the call and free up more time for, for doing the fun parts and the creative parts and the relationship building parts. Um, I think that is an easy win that really helps those teams work together uh, at a much better level. And I've seen that happen um, sort of in real time over the last couple of years uh, within several companies um, as people are kind of getting more used to more digital ways of working. And I think everyone in logistics and supply chain is so busy, uh, as you know, it has become very apparent even to the mainstream media that this is incredibly important. Um, so I think, uh, everyone's looking for what is that opportunity that I can get a little bit of that grunt work off my plate. 100%. I think if you, if you as a marketer are going to sales and you're saying, I want to help you, you know, automate some of these mundane tasks. And then in exchange, you can also see some of the data of what's working, direct data of like what's working for them. And if that messaging is resonating with the leads that they're going after. So it's a complete like win-win situation. We don't have to fight sales. We can work with them in order to hopefully as a marketer, understand what's driving ROI. Now, when it comes to social media, uh, with people in particular, they, they want to, they want to get started right on social media, but they just don't really know where to start when you're onboarding, maybe a new client or you're talking to them through it. What are some ways that you help coach them in getting started with social media? Is it really just as simple as like, just start posting or is there more, obviously there's probably more nuance to it. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, what I always say in my like personal approach is always like, listen more than you talk. If you're really starting from a baseline of like, we're not doing anything today and we want to get started. Um, there is so much to be gained from just going and being in the places where your desired audience is and listening to the things that we're, they're saying. So, you know, if you're trying to develop a product, like, you know, there's so many freight tech companies out there, right? You could just go and uh, if you're a TIA member, like be a part of the um, boards that they have, like the communication boards and, um, and start reading the problems that people are facing. And I feel like there's so much insight in there, even if you never posted anything of your own or tried to use that as kind of a marketing or sales channel, um, you could use that to start inspiring your content, thinking about topics to post about um, or Reddit. For instance, I like love Reddit as a place where people just kind of are uh, still have, I guess, more of an anonymous approach to the internet and therefore are willing to put things out there. And maybe it's just a funny meme and maybe it's like a rant about a company, things like that. Um, but really, that's the first thing I always look for is like, what is that insight about who your people are and what they care about, what they're passionate about, and what is the language they're using to talk? Um mm -hmm. And then, you know, then comes the just start posting part, right? I don't think you have to be precious about waiting to post, but um, I think knowing your audience is the, the number one most important thing um, that I would suggest to anybody who is starting fresh and not really sure where to go. Yeah, that, that's a really good idea with going to some of these, you know, groups and some of the, you know, like the TIA or the, the TMSA, which we're both, uh, you know, members of that organization and board members as well. And so you hear direct, like, I don't want to say like from the horse's mouth, but that's, you know, the phrase that I'm going to use here. Um, but yeah, you can really hear their words and how they use them in their own words, because sometimes it really is so easy to get caught up in our own jargon and, you know, thinking that everybody knows our own, you know, acronyms and things like that. But if you're in involved yes. in those types of groups, you can hear those phrases, you know, being used. Um, what about the complaint, uh, you know, or yeah, probably a little bit of a complaint from folks who are like, well, how do I just not sound like everybody else? We're all, you know, what they mm -hmm. say is we're all freight brokers, you know, we're all saying the same things. How do I not sound like everybody else when I'm on social media? Do you have any tips for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, it is very easy to sound like everybody else. And I think, uh, there is, I was having a, a back and forth on LinkedIn at one point recently about, um, people that were, uh, having like other people ghost write or ghost post on their behalf. And that is like, oh, you can do that. Like somebody else could write on my behalf. And it is, um, you know, the, the reality is like, yes, there are people that are doing that, but, you are the only true you, right? And everybody, I think, has something in their life that they are a little bit of an expert about that makes them unique. And that, for me personally, is when I get really excited about seeing a video that somebody made or something that they wrote is, is that level of expertise where they can speak from their personal experience. And, you know, maybe it even is if you're somebody who's just starting out in your career, that your personal experience is the experience of just getting started and something that you encountered in your day to day. Um, but is that real kind of like human moment of something that happened and something that you learned from it? And I'm not suggesting that you follow the sort of templatized, uh, you know, cringe LinkedIn post template <laughs> of, oh, I was doing an interview the other day and a candidate said X, Y, Z. Um, <laughs> but I do think that, you know, you can, you can look at what other people have done as content and, um, bring your own unique expertise to it. And, you know, maybe you're doing something similar, but you always can have your own lens on it, um, and bring that authenticity. And, uh, you're the only one who can write as you, but you have to be maybe brave to say something that not everyone else is saying. Very true. Now uh, we have time for a couple more questions and, and I, I definitely wanted to get this one in about the famous like ROI question. What is the mm -hmm. ROI or uh, of content marketing, of social media marketing? I'm sure you get this a lot with running your agency. Uh, how do you answer the ROI question? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I'm a little bit of an ROI nerd. I like love data, um, maybe as evidenced by I, my earlier comment that I like looking at, like what websites people were looking at, but, um, I, so I really, 
uh, personally love HubSpot. I know it's not in everyone's price range, but I love building custom dashboards and being able to really see um, all sorts of data in a visual manner, like at a glance. And it takes a little bit to build them out at first, but once you get those set up and then you can kind of get your automated monthly report and a lot of tools do similar things. So it's certainly not like they're the only one out there. Um, it is, it is actually amazing to see the ROI on things like that. The biggest thing that I think trips people up is, okay, if we're doing activities like social media, like content marketing, um, I can't put a dollar sign against that because I don't really know like what component of this went into a sale that eventually happened, right? Like there's always kind of that breakdown of, okay, well, we, we did this campaign, we spent X on it, we got Y number of leads and, you know, they came and they opened these emails and they did these things, time passes, some proportion of those eventually turns into sales. If you really have your process locked down and everything buttoned up, you certainly can calculate the ROI everywhere along that process. But for many people in industries, you know, maybe your sales cycle is six months or nine months long, and there's a lot of different touch points in that. And so it's really difficult to point to, you know, what did this individual social media post really do in that? Um, And uh, I think sometimes people get like tripped up by that as a thing, like, oh, I need to know what this one social media post did. Right. (laughs) It's completely Um, unrealistic. So I like to try to think of like, yeah, like, you know, nobody ever is sitting there asking, like, what what was the ROI of um, this specific kind of billboard or, like, event we were attending, um, you know? And I think people are doing more of that now. I think people are examining their budgets and, and trying to narrow down on that. But, uh, you know, can you point to a bigger picture of we are growing over time and all of these factors are part of that bigger picture? Um, and you know, measure the small things where you can. Are we getting video views? Are we getting engagement? And are those things going up over time? But try not to get too obsessed with that data. Look at it as learning opportunities, but not something you have to make a decision off of every single data point, as long as everything's pointing in the right direction. Yeah, it's kind of like an ecosystem, like a marketing ecosystem where you can't really pinpoint, you know, is it this tree that's contributing to, you know, the overall well-being of the forest? It's much more complicated yeah. and nuanced than that. All right, Michelle, where can yeah. folks follow you, follow more of your work, get in touch with Drop and Hook, all that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So we're dropandhookcontent.com. Um, and I'm uh, at LeBlankly on, you know, pretty much any social media channel where that would be a way to find me or, um, you know, just under my name on LinkedIn. Uh, Always happy to chat with anybody. Um, Michelle at dropandhook.com if you're an email person as well. Um, And uh, Drop and Hook content is our our brand social channel. So um, we have an email newsletter. We're going to be at uh, the TMSA Executive Summit in October and um, FreightWaves F3 coming up in November. So lots of opportunities to connect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your perspective, Michelle. Awesome interview. And and we look forward to seeing you at F3. Yeah, I'm really excited. All right. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Thank well, you. let's get into our next interview with Nick. He is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing of the Midwest Division over at OEC Group. So let's welcome in Nick because we have some important questions to get to and we got about 10 minutes to do it. So hopefully we could do like kind of a rapid fire. So welcome in, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, <how are> awesome. <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, for the last. <laughs> Oh, no, no worries. Um, so I've been uh, sort of naive about, you know, sort of the, in general, about the electrical grid and things like that. And so for you, for your topic that you were coming on the show is to talk about the shortage of transformers. So how do transformers fit into the overall, you know, sort of, I guess, at a fifth grade level, how do transformers fit into the overall electricity, electrical grid? How, do, how does it all fit together? Well, there's there's um, a lot of components. And again, I, I'm the expert in the freight portion of it, but there's, um, you know, first of all, all rare earth metals come from uh, China that we use, which make our microchips, among a ton of other things, batteries, um, transformers. So we're really reliant on them. Even if we did decide to build or develop them here, we still need the um, raw products to come from Asia. And so why, I guess, the transformers itself, uh, why are they in such short supply right now? Um, well, it's basically the supply chain and the limited places you can get them from 
And, uh, you know, we have a lot of congestion, mainly in the U.S. at our ports and rails. Um, you know, the steamship lines left a lot of empties there. We still broke records in July as far as uh, imports arriving to the U.S. So um, it, it's not that far behind us that we had all this volume coming in. That's um, And then, again, when it gets to Porter Railroad, there's no real um, priority in the line of how things move. So um, it, you never know what's going to be put on the train first or the truck first. How have you and the and the company sort of tried to alleviate some of these congestion points, bottlenecks? Um, you know, may, obviously everybody's heard about the you know the congestion on the West Coast port, which seems to be uh, you know alleviating now. How are you guys combating that? Is it you know a multi-port strategy or you know multi-country strategy? Tell us a little bit about how you're breaking that down. Well, we're giving people options and letting them decide, you know, how it works with their business model. For example, a lot of people are avoiding the West Coast. There still isn't a contract signed between the Longshoremen and the PMA. So that's still hanging out there. So a lot of people are choosing the Gulf Coast or the East Coast. The issue with that is we need chassis under the containers once it comes off the ship. So remember, 40% of imports come through LA Long Beach. So now if you move a bunch of that volume to Houston or New York or Savannah, they don't have the chassis the wheels to put on the trucks to unload them. So that's another additional thing that's causing a lot of issues. Not, you know, not to mention the fact that people are going to East and East coast and Gulf coast ports that can't handle the volume that LA normally does. And so with a lot of these different congestions, especially when it comes to, you know, supply chain challenges, we've seen other manufacturers, you know, sort of really push to bring manufacturing back to the U S to Mexico, mm -hmm. um, South America. Yes, Is there any kind of right. movement being made it, it, on the transformer well, side? Is it? similar yeah yeah with everything there is and we saw it first when the um you know the trump tariffs what came into play and an extra 25 percent a lot of things people started looking for other places to manufacture this the problem is not many countries are educated enough or progressive enough to handle the technology piece and china has really um you know, they're, they're really good at it and have been good at it for a long time. So there's not many options when you look at where to go. You know, some of the countries are crooked and hard to do business with. Other ones aren't educated enough to handle the technology. And that's that's the biggest thing that's stopping people from moving um, to other countries that are that are closer. In addition, I think people don't realize to move a container from Shanghai to, let's say, Chicago costs less than a truck from L.A. to Chicago or a truck from, uh, let's say, Texas or Mexico um, to Chicago. Obviously, the rail is an option, but still, when you look at the, how good they are with the technology in China and then how the supply chain, the reasonable costs and, um, you know, to get here, um, it's hard to compete with that. And so are you seeing, you know, maybe with, with some of the, the slowdowns in purchasing and the, the slowdowns in other areas of the economy, are you seeing shipping easing up a little bit for transformers in order to prepare, you know, maybe for hurricane season or the coming winter months? Or is it really this is a, a, a section of the supply chain where it's still really challenging to ship these goods? Um, it's still challenging, but it is lightening up, um, you know, week by week. It's a slow process. Um but things are getting a little better because the demand and the ordering and the importing volumes aren't as big in August and September as they were in July and, and previous months. So that's helping a little, but it's going to take a while to get back to the transit times we're used to. And so I, I would imagine that for a lot of who's purchasing transformers, is it like companies, <laughs> is it city governments, like yeah. who yeah, is yeah, making yeah, these yeah. purchases? <laughs> Well, that's the thing. It's companies. So, you know, for example, if you're to import a, let's say, a whole car or a whole machine, you have to pay a high duty on it. But and that's so the assembly work happens here. So a lot of those, it's companies ordering these things, the transformers to put along with other um, products. And so how are you, I guess, advising, you know, some of your clients and the people that, that you work with, how are you advising them in order to avoid these congestion, you know, the, the sourcing, the, the component of the component, all of those different, I guess, supply chain challenges? How, how is your company helping alleviate those? Well, the best thing we can do is visibility. We can't change, you know, the rigid structure of the supply chain. It's just the way it is. Um, so we're trying to give them as much visibility as possible. For example, we're letting our customers know the average dwell time at a port or at a railhead or how long it takes the train. And we're updating that every week um, to kind of let them know. But there's no way we can possibly speed up, you know, the supply chain. As we head into sort of, you know, some of these like colder months where there's going to be more strain on the electrical grid and electrical systems, do you see this problem getting better or getting worse? Or maybe are there some ways that, you know, companies that are ordering these transformers can avoid any potential catastrophes in the coming months? 
Well, obviously, the, the new way of doing it is is we work just in time, and then now people are carrying bigger inventory, so they don't run out and don't have to wait so long. So that's the best thing to do is keep more inventory on hand, which which is tough sometimes financially. All right, Nick. Well, where can folks, I guess, you know, follow more of your work, maybe get more information on, on what's going on with transporter shipping mm-hmm. or the transformer shippings um, and, you know, get in contact with you if they're facing, you know, some of these congestion choke points all across the country. We can find me on LinkedIn, um, Nick Klein, K-L-E-I-N. Um, and I'm an OEC group as well as our website, OECgroup.com. Awesome. Perfect. We will link those in the show notes. Thank you for helping us shed a light on, you know, obviously an issue that more folks need to be aware of. Especially for everything it's going to take right till next spring to sort out. Hmm. That's good insight. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for joining the show. And we will stay updated on what the hell is going on with the electrical <laughs> system within this country. <laughs> thank you, Nick. All right, two great interviews and a good topic down, already done. So let's move into the final topic for the show. We got about 10 minutes left, so we got plenty of time to show off some of these different, you know, ships and vehicles and all the things that help bring us this show to you live helps you you know use the internet from you know your your cell phone or from your desktop or whatever kind of device that you own and so let's talk about the logistics of the internet and in case you didn't know you know or with the internet in general or what powers it essentially it is cables that are run across the ocean floor all across the globe so if you're you're watching the show and I'll, I'll try to describe it for those who are listening, but it's essentially all of these, what looks like a shipping route, all of the different trade lanes across the world. That's essentially what the cables on the bottom of the ocean floor look like that power our internet. And so this is what powers 90% of our modern day internet is all is located at the bottom of the ocean floor. So when folks think that they are, you know, sending things to the cloud and, you know, storing things in the cloud, it's really actually being powered by these crazy cables that are are just insane to manufacture, that are insane to ship, and even more insane to lay on the bottom of the ocean floor itself. So I wanted to show a clip that I found from uh, this company called Fluctus, which they feature, you know, different, you know, ships from all around the world and their functionality. And one of the, the ways that they create this video is that they highlight how internet cables are created and then how they're ultimately laid on the ocean floor. So it's about a, a little over a minute long clip. So bear with me and uh, let's go ahead and play it. Despite all the impressive technology that goes into cable manufacture today, underwater cables have actually been around for over 150 years. Indeed, the very first transatlantic telegraph cable was laid between 1854 to 1858 and was capable of sending entire messages in a matter of minutes from Ireland to Newfoundland. Of course, back then, these cables were laid haphazardly by slow-moving steamships. Today, the job is done by specialized vessels with unique rotary sections for cable storage and deployment. They're also built with special mooring systems and flat bottoms, which enable them to reduce motion when operating in both shallow and deep water. The interior of these unique vessels is equally intriguing. The most notable is the way the entire center of the ship is dedicated to the cable laying process. With thousands of feet of tether for the ROUVs, in addition to the underwater cables, vast sections of the ship are completely dedicated to storage space. There are also specially equipped sections from which the movements of the ship, cable laying devices, and ROUVs can be coordinated via remote control. As we continue to see an increase in the demand for offshore power, no doubt these massive cable laying vessels will become a more frequent sight on oceans and lakes all around the world. However, this process is still susceptible to a variety of unique challenges and problems. Now this, that video in particular was super fascinating to watch. And if you were listening to it, you're probably like, what's wrong with this person's voice? Well, we sped up the clip a little bit just because uh, they are really slow talkers. And so we sped it up a little bit in order to fit all of this information into this segment. So if you notice that part, yeah, that was uh, definitely my call in order to speed that clip up. But it's really, really cool how they manufacture the cables themselves because it is like a traditional internet cable of what we would almost envision like a power line right outside of our house, but just lay 
laid on the floor of the ocean and they have to protect, they have a series of protection that goes around these cables in order to prevent uh, different animal attacks. Like there's, it's a common occurrence for these cables to be e bitten by sharks. And so they have to, whenever they, they have this noted, you know, that an issue is happening with an internet cable, they have to go and use special technology to scour the ocean floor and find out where these sharks have bitten the internet cables in order to get them fixed. So I thought that that was another really funny note um, from that video. Now, we've kind of talked about how the internet cables and just really communication cables have been laid on the ocean floor, but the really the first big challenge for the internet itself was Y2K, you know, the countdown from 1999 to 2000. And that was such a crazy time because not only were, you know, the conspiracy theories and all of that stuff around, you know, uh, different Mayan calendars and things like that of what's going to happen um, during, you know, the, the 2020 click or not 2020, but the 2000 click over. But there were a lot of different components within the technology space that had to be solved, or we were likely going to face a technological crisis that we never really envisioned. So let's play that clip on what happened with Y2K. This $600 billion computer bug never actually happened. Up until the 1990s, computers conserved memory by only storing the last two digits of a year. However, with the turn of the century approaching, this meant that PCs wouldn't be able to differentiate between, say, 1901 and 2001. This is famously known as the Y2K problem, and experts estimated that entire industries would get wiped out. However, come midnight on January 1st, 2000, the expected issues ended up being minimal. Now, what that clip doesn't highlight is the programmers that literally spent hours and hours, sometimes years, in order to rewrite entire computer software programs in order to make sure that that bug never happened. And there were stories from developers and programmers that spent days leading up until the new year and even days after the new year in order to prepare and monitor. And what the one developer was really talking about is he was in his office along with several other programmers, and it was the countdown for the first country to hit uh, New Year's Eve, to hit midnight. And New Zealand was the first one. And so when New Zealand, you know, their, their clocks ticked over to the year 2000, that was when they knew, okay, whew, they could breathe a sigh of relief to know that all of the fixes that they had implemented actually worked. And so I thought that that was really uh, a really fascinating look into how some people spent their New Year's Eve in 1999 in order to make sure that the rest of our technology and what functions as far as the rest of the globe is functioning properly and as it should. So we evolved from the telegram cables to the high tech super cables um, to fixing really like global internet outages or the potential of global internet outages. But how do we evolve from the AOL dial up to Wi Fi and to fiber internet of how it works today? Let's play a clip on how Wi Fi works. Hey, I have a question. Yeah, sure. If I sent you an email right now, how would it get off of my laptop? So we wanted to get to your Wi-Fi router, right? But that's a laptop, it's not connected to anything. So something's gotta go through the air. Yeah, 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 exactly. But what is going through the air? Like what physically is coming out of my laptop and going somewhere? Radio waves. Radio waves? Yeah, your computer and your phone are both radios. They're just really high tech ones. Here's the interesting challenge though. You've probably heard that everything inside of your computer is binary, right? Yeah, ones and zeros and something. Awesome. Okay, so the real question is, how does your computer take that binary information and put it onto a radio wave? There are two classic ways of doing this. The first is that you could change the amplitude or the height of the wave, right? So you could say every tall wave is a one and every short wave is a zero. So one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 etc. The other option is you could change the frequency of the wave. So you could say every long wave is a one and every short wave is a zero. So one, zero, zero, one, one, etc. Your computer now is doing this in much more complicated ways, but it's all based on these ideas. You know what's really cool about that? What? Somebody figured out how to build it. Like, we talk about the internet as though it's this magical thing, but it's a physical reality and somebody figured out how to build it. Exactly. I think that's awesome. 
think it's awesome too. And I was doing a lot of, you know, fun research when it comes to this. And Cleo Abram is one of my favorite follows on social media, on YouTube. So if you don't follow her, she has a lot of great content. If you like this kind of content, then you will love a lot of the stuff that she produces. And speaking of her, let's play the final clip with why cables and not satellites? What's the next internet space race? So I know the internet mostly doesn't rely on satellites, it relies on cables under the ocean. But then why do I keep hearing about Elon Musk's satellites, and also Jeff Bezos, and also maybe Richard Branson? There's an internet space race going on right now, and Elon Musk's company, Starlink, is ahead. These are all real satellites that are in orbit for Starlink right now. That's cool and all, but what's so different about them? Okay, so older satellite systems like HughesNet and Viasat keep their satellites really high up, and they keep them stationary over one spot on the surface, which lets them them cover just huge areas. But when you're up that high, it takes a really long time to send radio waves back and forth. If you brought the satellites lower, you could reduce that time, but you need a lot more of them to cover the same area. And to stay at that altitude, they'd need to orbit. This is what all these new projects are trying to do, but Starlink is doing it fastest. Wait, so that's why I keep seeing TikToks like these. People can see them. Yeah, there are a lot of them up there already. This kind of looks like a problem. I'm gonna need to make another video. Yeah, super fascinating insight. And I, again, love her videos. If you, it, so it, explaining all of the logistics of the internet and where we currently are, where we've been, and where, more importantly, where we're headed. So I hope you guys enjoyed that topic. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. If you can find more of my work over at everythingislogistics.com, and then we will be back here right next week, Thursday at 2 p.m., with more fun topics just like this. Thank you guys.